Good morning and welcome to today's service. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Randall Ferris and I'm the staff parish chairman here at Hawaii. As you all know, Pastor Mike and Laurel have retired effective July 1st. I would ask that you keep them in your prayers as they begin their new journey. As the old saying goes, as one door closes, another one opens. Bishop Beard has assigned Pastor Mary Arnold to be our new spiritual director starting today. This is not the way I envision announcing her, but pandemic dictated otherwise. Pastor Mary and her husband, Pastor Paul, come to us from the Peoria area where they both served. We are excited to have them here in Dwight and look forward to Pastor Mary sharing her ministries with us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory and thank you for our many blessings. And as we are blessed, help us to be a blessing to others. We ask as the congregation that you bless Pastor Mary as she shepherds the flock here. Give her boldness in her words and bless her ministry. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. God's blessings to you all. Stay safe and enjoy today's service. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Reverend Mary Arnold, the new directing pastor here at the Dwight United Methodist Church. Thank you so much for joining us for this weekend's worship on July 5th, Independence Weekend, where we celebrate our freedom and give thanks to the sacrifices that are made so that we can be free. I'm so glad to be with you and coming to live in your community and be leading you in our spiritual endeavors as we move forward with our great God into the future, knowing God is always with us. We want to give our best wishes to Reverend Mike and Laurel as they enter their retirement, keeping them in our prayers and thoughts and, and just thanksgivings for their wonderful years of ministry. We will be having a celebration for Reverend Mike and just and Laurel, so just keep uh, paying attention to the announcements and we'll be sure that you're aware of that. We want some big, exciting news to be told to you that we are going to be back in the building this coming weekend on July 12th. So I hope you join us either at 8 o'clock or 10.30 for our services. We'll have our traditional service at 8 a.m., our early service, and then our 10.30 will be our praise service, our contemporary service. So we hope that you make plans to come and join us, but be safe. Masks will be mandatory. So be sure and get your mask out and plan to wear it the whole time you're in the building, as well as social distancing. Keep your distance. No hugging, none of those wonderful things we enjoy about church life. They still have to be put on hold in the safety of all of us. So we'll be checking you in and using your hand sanitizer as much as possible and just keeping safe. That's our plan. So we hope you join us for a wonderful celebration of being back in our building after a time away. We also want to say thank you to Randall and Judy Ferris for welcoming us and making us feel so welcome. Randall is our chair of Pastor Parish and the entire Pastor Parish Committee and all of you who made Paul and I feel welcome as we move here and get settled into our new home. And we so thank you for that too. Well, I thank Matt who's been helping me with these recording and doing all the folks who just helped me as we move forward and keep moving our church in the direction that God's calling it to be. I hope you printed your bulletin material and that you have your communion supplies ready. Uh, in a little while, we'll be taking communion together at the end of the service. Friends, as we start, a tradition I'd like to bring with my, me to join and share with you is this saying. I know you start out with, this is the day that the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it, and we'll continue that. But also, a saying I'd like us to maybe pick up, if we can, is God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. So let us prepare our hearts for worship as we enjoy this beautiful prelude that Ellie's prepared for us.
was sent to you earlier this week. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. The firmaments are proclaiming God's praise. Their message has gone out all over the earth. Let us join our hearts and voices in the worship of our great God. Praise be to our God. together for moments with children. Let's take a look at some of my pictures. I have a flower. I have a tree. There's some mountains. Lightning. And the ocean. All of these are beautiful pictures. And all of these are things that God made. Today, our story comes from the Old Testament book of Job. And Job was a man. And Job had a lot of problems and difficulties in his life. He was a farmer and he lost all his animals. He lost his children and he lost his health. His wife told him to stop believing in God. And his friends thought, well, maybe he's getting what he deserves. But Job still tried to believe in God. At the end of the story, Job was feeling pretty sad and down and sorry for himself. So he cried out to God and God heard and listened and answered Job. And God said, Job, remember, I am God and I do great and amazing things. Let's see what I brought to help us with the story. Today, I have a cardboard box and it's just a regular cardboard box. It would be good to put your toys in or your books. I know that Pastor Mary, our new pastor, has a lot of these boxes sitting in her office and at her house as she's unpacking to be with us here at Dwight United Methodist Church. And these boxes help us keep organized. So we have to put books in one box and things that go in the kitchen in one box and things that are our sheets and our towels go in one box and have to have the right size box has to fit right. If I tried to put a chair in this box, it would not work because it's the wrong fit. Well, sometimes that's what we try to do with God. We try to put God in a box. But God is bigger than the earth and the sun and the universe. He created the universe. Our minds can't even understand how God can do all the things that God does. He's all-powerful 
and he sees and knows everything all at one time. So why do we try to put God in a box? Sometimes, maybe we think God can't really do something. That is never the case. God can do anything. God has no limits. You can trust him with anything. If God puts something big on your heart to pray about, pray about it. Don't push it aside or think that it's impossible. Just pray and you'll be amazed at the awesome things that God can do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Don't put God in a box. Pray as big as you can so that you and your faith will grow. Let's fold our hands and bow our heads and say a little prayer. Dear God, we thank you for all the amazing things that you have done and all the things that you've created in the universe, including us. Help us to remember, Lord, that there's nothing impossible for you, and you always listen to our prayers. And all God's people said, Amen.
loving and gracious Heavenly Father, how thankful we are that even though we are two or three gathered around a computer screen or our phones and long distancing, you are still with us. We thank you that you are the God who is big enough to be at all places and at all times. We ask, O oh Lord, right now that as we gather in worship, that as our hearts are before you, you will examine us and that you will forgive us, that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that through the blood of Jesus, though our sins are scarlet, you will make us whiter than snow. We ask for healing for those who are sick in our church family and in our extended friends and family. We especially continue to pray for our health care workers and other uh, people who are working hard on the front lines of this battle against COVID-19. We pray, O oh Lord, that you may send us a victory and deliverance. We pray for the economic uplifting, not only of our country, but especially of those who are really struggling right now. And if we have plenty, O oh Lord, help us to be generous in giving. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you continue to protect and deliver us, and we just pray that we may rest fully in your love this day. Lord, we lift all of our spoken and unspoken concerns unto you. Before a word crosses our lips or a thought our minds, you know it full well. So help us to trust in your power and presence working for good in our lives. And help us to just give you all that we carry, that we might walk boldly and uprightly in your love. We come to you in that name of that love, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. And we continue praying together as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The word of God um, we're going to share together is from the book of Job in the Old Testament, chapter 38, and we're going to be sharing together verses 4 through 7 and 34 through 36. And this passage I've chosen as we begin our new journey together is one that helps me focus on what's really important and true. The God I worship and the God I hope you know and worship is the one who laid the foundations of the earth and all of existence. Our God has heard and experienced things we have not. Our God has wisdom and knowledge that far exceeds anything that you and I may encounter or know. Our God is much more than we can even fathom. Our God is magnificent. You know, Job's story is a hard story. Job was in a hard and difficult place when he encountered God. He was in a terrible place of grief and loss. Everything that he had and everything that he had known had changed. He had lost everything. And God invites Job into a new future by revealing a glimpse of what God knows to Job. This revelation brings Job out of that pit of despair and propels him into this future that God is waiting for him. So let's hear God's word for us from the book of Job, chapter 38, beginning in verse 4. The Lord is speaking to Job out of a whirlwind when he says, and he asks Job, Were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of water may cover you? Can you send lightning so that they may go and say to you, Here we are. Who has wisdom in the inner parts and has put it in our inner parts or given understanding to the mind? Do you know? 
We know it is our great God. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our great God. Let us pray together. May the words of my, my mouth, O oh Lord, and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Help this be a Pentecostal moment, Lord. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that at what, we, what I say, uh, you, they may hear in the way that you would desire it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, we haven't moved for 12 years. Now, you know, many things can change in 12 years. Children we knew as preschoolers when we came to our last appointment have graduated from high school and are now heading off to college. Many of them that we knew as children or, you know, middle schoolers have gotten married even. They have grown and matured and started out on their own lives. Think about what's happened in your life in the last 12 years. As you live through them, you don't realize how much things are changing. We're good friends with a younger couple. The husband is a clergy person, and he, uh, my husband, Paul, was his mentor through the process, and we're very close to their family. Um, and we really love and watching their lives. And, you know, that's what we love about online is that though we're distanced, we can see uh, close, see their lives, see their kids growing and changing, and it's wonderful. And so I was encouraged as his wife posted during our, both of our packing times, because they were moving the same time we were, as I said, then I was encouraged to see her post. She was just completely exhausted and worn out with it all, and I thought, oh, thank goodness. I'm not the only one that's getting worn out by this. I'm not doing so bad, and that encouraged me to keep going until she posted on the day of her move her kitchen, and she posted everything put away and in place. So I love her very much, very much. She's very dear to me. I admire her so much. But you know, friends, I had to quit looking at that post for a while. I mean, at my house, we found the pepper, but where is the salt? Don't know. <laughs> Job is considered by some scholars to be the oldest book in the Bible. Now, of course, you'll say to me, well, what about the contents of Genesis? Obviously, creation starts before Job. Yes, clearly. But you know how they believe that the contents of Genesis and actually the first five books of the Bible came together was through Moses' leadership. And obviously, then his scribe, which would be jo Joshua, the son of Nun. So they believe, and I like to, over I like to think of Joshua overseeing the collection and making sure those holy writs were documented correctly into the oral tradition, into writings that are preserved to, for us this day. So Job is an unexpected uh, story in the Bible, to be the first story especially, of a man who is righteous and has unexpected suffering. It comes out of nowhere. Kind of reminds us of what happened with COVID-19. And Job records his tragedies, his response to those tragedies, and the response of his wife, friends, and toward the end, God's response to them. And that's what we looked at a little bit in our passage for today. God doesn't offer an explanation that we might hope for in the midst of challenges and trials. I want God to say, this is how it's going to work out. This is how it is. I want God to do these things. But that's not what God answers in this case. God simply reveals himself to Job and reminds Job some of the things that God knows full well. God knows things that Job and we know nothing about. Surprisingly, this revelation leads to an attitude of repentance for Job and gives Job comfort. I find that a little surprising in how that story works out. Moreover, it propels Job into the future. It propels him out of his suffering and into this future that God has planned for Job. Job's story ends with Job's life being filled with family and possessions and blessings, much more than what he had ever at the beginning. Job is considered wisdom literature, which 
can be found all sorts of places, but it can be found throughout the Bible. We know Jesus did many teachings on wisdom. And what is wisdom literature? How do you kind of know what wisdom li literature is? Well, wisdom li literature addresses questions like why things are the way they are, or it addresses how things could be better. It, it addresses things like what is God like, or practical things like how to live a good life. One of the best-known books of the Bible about wisdom is Proverbs. Maybe you've read that. That's a wisdom book. But there are other books that have a lot of wisdom in them, like Esther. And as I said, the Gospels, Jesus had wisdom that he shared with his followers, with us. We just need to read them. The interesting thing about wisdom literature, I think, is that often you can glean something from the surface, but mostly it never fully answers your challenging questions like this one. Like, why do good people suffer? And what it does instead is it gives you an answer that you have to chew on and reflect and take with you. That's how you know what wisdom literature really is. is because it's not a simple answer usually. Although Proverbs has some simple answers. Do this and this will happen. And that's true. And, you know... That struggle helps us even though it's hard. We don't always like to struggle, but like a butterfly coming out of the cocoon, a struggle can help us be all we can be. And though I want Job to do things, it never gives that answer to suffering, though I've always wanted it to, and I've read it several times. I don't know why I think it's going to appear because it's not in there. Job was the greatest person in his land. Can you imagine? Think of the greatest person you know. Job not only made sure he was right with God himself all the time, he did extra sacrifices to make sure his adult children were right with God. How important is it for you to be right with God? Is it so important that you want to make sure your family is right with God? We always hope our family is. But are we willing to make sacrifices on their behalf? to approach the Lord for them? That's a good question for us to reflect on. Being right with God was Job's top priority. Again, is it ours? And not only was Job righteous, he was also wealthy. He was the wealthiest person in that land. He was a leader in his community. He had a large family and he had many friends. Everything in his life seemed to be really good until it was all taken away. Now, Job had friends that came and sat with him during this time of suffering. Um, they came and sat with him, and they offered their counsel on why these things had happened to him. The number one reason being that Job certainly must have sinned and needed to repent. But Job was adamant that he had not sinned in this case, and he wanted his day in court. And if you read the beginning of Job, you know that Job did not sin to bring this about. Job was innocent when this happened. And though Job is filled with suffering, even despair, an interesting thing about Job is he never gives up his faith that God is real and that God will answer. Do you believe God is real? Most of us do. But more importantly, do you believe God is going to answer you? Job declares in chapter 19, verse 25, I know my Redeemer lives. Job remains confident that God is capable of Job's redemption, though it seems a long time in coming. It always does when we're suffering. God does something to bring about change in Job's life, a life of new beginnings. God shows up, and what he offers Job is something completely unexpected. And what Job has to do is receive what God is offering him. What Job has to do is live in to the future God presents him. I think that living into the new is a wonderful part of change. It's a hard part, but it's a wonderful part. It can be difficult, though, especially if we don't let go of the old. If we cling to the old and we say it's got to be this way, then it's going to be a struggle for us. Socrates is an ancient wisdom leader himself. He said this, The secret of change 
is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. When we first entered this COVID shutdown, a young woman came up to my husband and I at some place we were at, and she just said to us while we were kind of waiting, she said, what an exciting time to be alive. And we were kind of taken aback by that. You know, it kind of just was like, what? But her sincerity and her zest for life were so evident. You could see it clearly in her, her eyes and, and in her countenance. She wasn't being insensitive to the suffering that many had endured. That wasn't it at all. It was that she was determined to do her best to find good that was still here. And more than that, she was looking for the good that was yet to come and yet to be revealed. So we had to agree. This certainly isn't a boring time to be alive, that's for sure. It's exciting in many different ways, some ways we don't want. But some ways we certainly do. We know much of what we've known has changed. Some are ready to embrace the new, like that young woman. Some are ready to focus their energy on living into it. While others are still clinging to the past. Still trying to bring the past into the present and then into the future. Some are ready to go forward and experience what awaits them. Some say, experiencing new things is good. It's good to learn new things. But what about you? What do you think God wants for your life? Well, we know God really wants all of us to live into the new with hope and trust. Many times in the Bible, God declares, See, I am making all things new. We need to remember the past, of course. We need to treasure and learn from our history. Our history as people of faith is the foundation on which our future is built. It's a foundation on which we can live into the future. Our history is that of our great God being with us. Our history of, is of our great God acting in mighty ways. Our history is of our great God overcoming our enemies, though often not as we would expect. Friends, our God is so much more. Our God is magnificent. Job could have clung to the past and continued to live in the grief of all that had happened to him. All that he had lost. That's completely legitimate. If you're living there, that's completely legitimate. He had lost so much. And in Job's story, there was a time for grieving. Those friends I told you about came and sat with him in the dust and ashes for seven days and seven nights, not saying a word, simply being present with him in his suffering. That's a true gift we can offer people. They said nothing, the Bible tells us, because they saw how great his grief was. The trouble came when they started sharing their own views and opinions with Job. Instead of simply being present with him and waiting with him until the Lord showed up, in a way they could understand when God chose to reveal themselves, they started painting a picture of Job and of God that wasn't true and wasn't real. God chastises them for that in his response, if you read it. What God's response does is bring a truth of how big our God is, and it brings it to the forefront of the situation. Job had experienced great loss. That was never going to change. We can't change the things that happened in our past. We can ask God to do that, and God's not going to do that, friends. That's not how God works. God doesn't wave his magic wand over our lives, and we wake up, and, and it's, you know, changed. Everything's altered. That's not how life works. We can't change the past, and we're not going to do that. But we can change the present. And by changing the present, we can change the future. What could change for Job was how he was going to live into his future. That's what could change for Job. He couldn't change what had happened to him, but it could change on how he was going to live into his future. What could change for Job was how he experienced and how he developed and understood his relationship.
relationship with our great God. We know that Job had faith before he lost everything. And we see that Job didn't let go of that faith in God's existence and God's power with his suffering. He didn't let go of that. You know, when Job learns the death of his children and the loss of all his possessions, the Bible says that Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped. Job said this, Naked I came from the womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That is a very famous saying that you might have already heard from Job. Because in all of Job's suffering, in all of his grief, in all this shock, the Bible records that Job did not sin nor charge God with wrongdoing. Now Job's wife can't bear to watch his suffering. Who could? I mean, it was horrible. And I'm dealing with her own suffering. And so she encourages Job to curse God and die. And Job answers her, Shall we receive the good at the hand of the Lord and not also receive the bad? I hope you've decided in your heart that like Job, no matter what is happening to you or might happen in your life, you will not let go of God. I hope that you're going to hold on tight to God no matter what. That's something I've resolved to do a long time ago, and I'm never going to let go of my great God. That's a good lesson and witness that Job gives to us. Job never let go of God. He brought his pain and his confusion to the Lord. He committed to persevere in his request for God's response to him, even though he wasn't prepared for how God did respond. You know, when I first read Job, and even when I read it today, though I've read it many times, I am a little put off by God's response. Where I want to know is that sweet God of the song, Jesus Loves Me. Where is the Kleenex God? Where is the hug and comfort God that I kind of picture Jesus as being? Where is the God of comfort? You know, the power of a, of a whirlwind, can you imagine that in your mind for a moment? The power of a whirlwind? We were in a tornado when I was a little kid. It blew out every window in our farmhouse on the one side, north side of our farmhouse. That was a lot of windows. It was very dramatic. And so I'm picturing this whirlwind. You've been around in Cole City. You know all about tornadoes. And so you can imagine, I think, what is God doing showing up in a whirlwind to someone who has lost everything? Right? God's practicing some social distancing there for sure. <laughs> You're not going to get too close to God on this one. And here's the truth of Job, friends. God shows up. And God shows up as God chooses to show up. When you call God, he's going to show up. He's already here, actually. We're going to be unveiled to his presence. But he, he's, he's going to show up. That's a truth that's run throughout the Bible. And it's run in my life, too. God is present. But God is not going to show up as I expect. I can't keep God in a little box. And neither can you. God is so much bigger, so much more than my experience or expectations. God is so big, so great, that he can handle everything that comes my way. He can handle everything that comes your way. God is magnificent. God can handle COVID-19. God can handle the change it's brought about to our entire world. God can handle a move to a new church and community. God can even handle that I am now your new pastor. Yes, he can. Even that is not too much for our great God. Surprise. God can handle things like a hard diagnosis or a difficult treatment plan. God can handle a betrayal, or a financial crisis, or a wayward child, or a bad choice, or simply our sin. The Bible makes it clear that God can handle anything life throws at us, including death. God tells us in Job's story, he tells us he can handle things. That's what these passages are about in the end of Job. He's telling Job, I handle things you have no idea about. But more than that, friends, God tells us in Jesus Christ. When Jesus went to the cross, he tells us that God is handling everything, even death, especially death. From the cross, 
we know God can handle it. God has got things under control. It's not surprising. Um, God's not surprised. God's not afraid. God's not wondering what God should do. No. I may be many times. You may be. But God's got this under control. God's never wondering. Our God is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. The rain, the mud, even the lightning, they answer to God's call and God's command. Think of that the next time a lightning storm is coming across the prairie. Think of it as the thunder answers it. All of that is under God's control. God knows much more than any of our best science. And we have some pretty good science out there. And yet God knows much more than that. God's greater than all of it. And in God's greatness, he invites us into a new relationship and a new future. A future of more. More love, more joy, more forgiveness, more mercy, more beauty, more wonder. More that is out of our control, yes? <laughs> And more blessing because of it. Because God is in control. As we live into that more, we too may join our voices with the singing and shouting and praising of the heavenly beings and the morning stars. And we may shout for joy of all the wonder that God does for us. And it starts for us as it did with Job. It starts with repentance. It starts at the cross. It starts at the table of the Lord's. It starts with the body and blood of Jesus Christ that was broken and shed for us. That's where we begin. It starts and ends with love and mercy. The love and mercy that our great God, our Heavenly Father, wants to pour into all of us, his beloved children. And it starts right now, friends. It starts today. Our God is righteous, and we become righteous when we have faith in his son, Jesus Christ, and follow where Jesus leads. That's how it works. And it's a grand adventure, for sure. Something to look forward to. So as we begin our new journey together, I hope you join me in beginning with our magnificent God, our God that can't be put in a box, that's too big to be contained. And I hope that you move together with him and me as we get ready for what God has awaiting us. These are exciting times for people of faith. They're not easy, no, but what time ever is. Living a life of faith isn't an easy life, but it's a wonderful life. It's exciting, but it's never easy. We have the opportunity and the invitation during these times to show how quickly and how generously our love can be shared. We can share our acceptance, our respect with others. We can share our hope. We can share Jesus. And that's what our job is to do. Our job is to show people Jesus. Amen? Amen. Please get your bread and your juice ready as we are going to experience anew the wonder of God's great love for us and the amazement of his great grace shown to us in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to give instructions on when you are to take the bread and juice, so don't do them yet until I bless the elements and we partake together. And I remind you, friends, the table is the Lord's. He invites all to come and share together. Friends, on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to the Father for it, he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat of this, all of you, for this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, and he gave thanks to the Father for it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and drink of this, all of you, for this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we will proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Let us pray together. Loving and gracious, magnificent God, 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered at the table, at the wherever we might be with our phones and devices and computers, however we are worshiping you this moment. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and on these gifts of bread and juice, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for this hurt and broken world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. O oh Lord, though these pieces of bread are one, they are made of many grains of wheat and other things, and our juice is made from many grapes that come together to be one, reminding us that we who are many are one in you. And as we are one, we are called to be the body of Christ to serve our broken and hurt world. So fill us now, O oh Lord, until our cup overflows that we may go forth faithfully, sharing your love, your goodness, your magnificence with all that we meet. In the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we come. Amen. All right, have your bread and juice ready. This is the body of Christ broken for you, friends. Take and eat. And this is the cup of salvation poured out for you. Take and drink. And let us give thanks to our great God as we give God the victory and he give, as God gives us the victory over all things in Jesus Christ. Amen. God's victory is already his. Ours is the victory to have in Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice, tell the same old if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got
May the Lord lift up his countenance before you and fill you to overflowing with his grace and peace. Go forth because our God goes with us. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. On this weekend, when we celebrate our freedom, remind us again of the great cost of that freedom. Bless those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. We are mindful of Jesus. Is that rain? Uh-huh. <laughs> I think we'll pause and redo that since I skipped a line <laughs> in this prayer and they have it printed. <laughs>